If you're like most other people, you're a lot more comfortable with an ordinary algebraic expression than you are with an ordinary algebraic fraction. There's something about a fraction that tends to be scary. We're going to do something about that in this module by using what you already know about arithmetic fractions. A question. What's the difference between the rules for manipulating arithmetic fractions and the rules for manipulating algebra fractions? The answer, there isn't any difference. So let's start at the beginning with an arithmetic fraction. An arithmetic fraction is one whole number divided by another whole number. The line between them, in either form, says divided by. 3 over 5 is 3 divided by 5. Obviously, then, an algebra fraction is just one algebra expression written over another algebra expression, with a line in between to say divided by. Another name for an algebra fraction is a rational expression. An algebra fraction or rational expression can be made up of anything from single letters to very complicated expressions. One thing we commonly do with arithmetic fractions is to reduce them, make them simpler. We do that by dividing top and bottom by a common factor. And the same thing works with algebra fractions. What will happen, for example, if we divide this expression first by x squared and then by y to the third. Both are common factors of top and bottom. We perform the two operations separately and carefully and end up with a simpler expression reduced to its simplest form. To be more precise, we get an expression which has no more common factors on top and bottom. Actually, you did the same thing when you worked on the laws for handling exponents. If that seems a little dim by now, you might want to review that module. Otherwise, plunge right in and reduce this expression to its simplest form. You can, of course, do a problem like this sort of all at once, or you can do it in steps, like me. I divide by 2, and by x squared, by y to the third, and finally, by z to the seventh which gives us our final answer. The answer has to be the same no matter how we attack the problem. But notice that it's all a question of factoring the top and the bottom to find common factors. That means, of course, that we may want to factor a complicated expression into simpler expressions in order to find some factors that match on top and bottom. If you have any trouble with this, review the two modules on factoring. Otherwise, factor away and look for the common factors on top and bottom. Not very hard to find. Divide top and bottom by x minus 2. And don't try to go any farther than that because there are no common factors left. So you have to be good at factoring because factoring is the whole ball game here. But beyond that, it's just like handling numbers. 
See if you can handle this one now. I begin by factoring, first extracting a common factor, the x on top, then another, the x on the bottom, and then factoring the two expressions in parentheses, which I'm familiar with from another module. In the results, I see some obvious common factors, top and bottom, that I can get rid of by dividing. Call it canceling, if you like same thing, to find my answer, which can't be reduced any further. In arithmetic and in algebra, we can reduce a fraction by factoring and dividing, sort of like trimming it down by taking the fat out of it. But that means, of course, that we could also expand or inflate a fraction by multiplying it if we wanted to we still get an equivalent fraction if we multiply top and bottom by the same number. The question is, do we want to? Yes, we do. Sometimes in algebra, we want to take a simple expression like x over y and complicate it by multiplying top and bottom by the same number. Everything you see in this example is equivalent to x over y. But why do it? Sometimes it's because you want to specify right from the beginning what the denominator is going to be. The problem is clearer when we look at it like this. We see that we have to factor the new denominator to see where it came from. Here, it looks like we multiply the original denominator by x plus 2y. So what we have to do is to multiply the numerator, x minus y, by the same thing. That gives us the nice, long, complicated answer we were looking for. And it's right. It's basically the same fraction we started with. Fatter, to be sure, but equally fat on top and bottom. It's not hard to find an answer like that if you start by factoring the new denominator. That's the key. Try this one now, and then come back with your answer. Immediately, I look for the key. How did I get from the old denominator to the new denominator? What did I multiply by? The answer, a plus 2b. So I multiply the numerator also by a plus 2b. And the result is a fraction entirely equivalent to the one we started with but now it has the denominator we were looking for. Now that we've seen both the reduction of algebra fractions and expansion or inflation, which is exactly the opposite, we're ready to look at multiplication and division of algebra fractions. Sounds terrifying, but once again, it's no different from what we do in arithmetic. 
arithmetic. Multiply fractions by multiplying numerators together and then multiplying denominators together. Algebra. Multiply fractions by multiplying numerators together and then multiplying denominators together. A little harder example. Same thing. Whenever you can, of course, you'll want to reduce the original fractions to simplify the whole thing. Notice that we're actually factoring in our heads here and then dividing. In algebra fractions, we have to write out the factors before we reduce by dividing. That really simplifies our work when we finally get around to doing the multiplying, which is what we were asked to do in the first place. Factor, divide to reduce, and then multiply. First, we factor. Then we simplify. And suddenly there's nothing left to multiply, just x minus 3, and that's the answer. This one may not be quite that simple, but you're ready for it now. Remember, factor, simplify, multiply, and that's it. First, I factor everything in sight. Then I reduce by dividing and multiply the few remaining terms to get my answer, which can't be reduced any further. Often I want to leave my answer in factored form like this. So here it is, the whole process of multiplication. Division, we can cover much more rapidly. Can you think of a fairly obvious reason for that? Actually, you're looking at the reason right now. There is one basic rule for the division of fractions. Invert the fraction you're dividing by that's normally the second one. And after that, you have a plain old multiplication problem. And that's what we just covered, so there's nothing new to learn. Sounds simple. Let's see. We're dividing by x plus 4 over x cubed. So that's the one we invert. We turn it upside down, change the divide sign to multiply, and then follow the rules for multiplying. Factor, simplify, multiply. We find our factors, we divide by canceling, and we have our answer in the simplest possible form. If you remember to perform that one step, inversion, and then multiply, there's nothing to it. Try this one now.
I know that the first thing I do will be to invert the fraction I'm dividing by, the second one here, and change the sign to multiply. And then I'll multiply, which means I'll factor and reduce everything I can and then multiply whatever's left. There is no single step that's difficult in all of this, but you do need lots of practice in bringing it together because you'll be using these methods constantly. So take a good look at the examples in your own textbook. And work out some of the problems. Each process is simple. All you need is practice. Good luck.